Uh, we're here to talk today about uh, a debate that is very hot right now in the United States. Uh, I, I don't think there's much of a debate going on about this in Europe um, because the left won this debate a long time ago over here so they don't have to talk about it anymore. Uh, but in America they haven't won it yet and therefore it's a big issue. And this is the issue of inequality and the whole idea of, of the evil of inequality. As you probably know, there's this uh, book by Piketty out there that's uh, now being endorsed by all the leading economists in the United States, or a lot of the leading economists in the United States, is the most important book of our generation um, because it advocates against uh, inequality and supposedly produces the data to prove that capitalism leads to inequality as if we didn't know that already. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's this massive argument and uh, the left is just falling right in line to advocate for this. Now, why do I say in Europe this battle has been lost? Well, you live here so you know, I think, that, that the idea of inequality, you know, certainly in Northern Europe is considered as a bad thing. That, that, uh, that the whole notion of inequality is perceived as immoral um, and that the masses have already accepted that. That's already baked into the political process uh, in, in Europe. In the United States, that's not true. Most Americans uh, think inequality is fine. Um, they don't think it's a big issue at all. They, they, they don't think it's a bad thing. And, you know, I really think that this is why the left is placing such a big emphasis, big push right now with Obama in office to really get this idea into the American people, to really capture this last bastion of a little bit of freedom, uh, a little bit of capitalism in the world. And they're making this big, big effort. And it's really across the entire leftist spectrum. I've never seen all the leftists get together on one idea and agree on it as, as adamantly as they are right now in the U.S. It's, it's, uh, it's the, as Obama said, Obama said in one of his uh, political uh, statements uh, that inequality is the issue of our generation, the issue of our time, the most important issue of our time. And I think that he's leading this uh, movement to try to really undercut the American view that says that inequality is, uh, that inequality is fine. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit, we'll talk, talk, give you my views on um, what I think lies behind the whole debate about inequality, uh, what they're trying to achieve, why I think it's obviously, why I think it's wrong, uh, why I'm a big fan of inequality generally. Um, but, and you know, to kind of discuss what lies, what I believe lies at the at the core of this and what, why, what uh, lies at the bottom of this. Um, and then we'll, do, we'll open up for questions, and, and uh, that'll be more fun anyway. Right? Uh, so uh, I'll talk for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that, and then we'll just, we'll just take questions. But in the meantime, if you really have a fucking question and uh, related to what I'm saying, if, if you wave at me, then uh, I don't mind uh, doing this more like a, uh, a classroom, given that we've got a small group here, than a formal lecture, which I don't particularly like. Um, teaching is much more fun than lecture, and for students and for the, I, you know, for, and for the professors. So let, let's start by first trying to understand what the issue is here with regard to inequality. So, so what is the what, what is the observable facts out there in reality that relate to inequality? Uh, are people equal? Are people equal? in any kind of metaphysical sense. We're all different. We're all unequal. We're born unequal. We all have different talents, we all have different skills, we all have different interests, we all have different passions, we all have different abilities. Human beings are not equal. Human beings are not equal. And indeed, uh, so the only sense in which we are equal is what? When, 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 in, when in Enlightenment they talked about all men are created equal, what did they mean by that? Given that just looking around the room, I can tell you you're not equal. Some of you are tall, some of you probably play basketball well, some of you. 
In what sense did the, 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 the Enlightenment talk about all men are created equal? So equal before the law. The sense was that an ideal legal system would treat all men equally. But it's more fundamental than equality before the law. The fundamental idea here is that all human beings have the same rights. Have the same rights. That is, we are all born free. We all have the same freedoms. What are rights? When I say I have a right to my life, what does that mean? It means I have a right to live my life as I see fit. I have a right to act, to make my life a success without you guys forcing me to do something I don't want to do. So in that sense, when people talk about all men are created equal, what they're saying is all men have the right to be free. All men have the right to be free of being coerced, have the right to be free from force, right to be free from violence. That there are no masters and slaves. Shouldn't be masters and slaves. <coughs> that masters and slaves are a way of imposing coercion, a way of imposing force, and therefore are wrong because they violate this notion of rights and they violate this notion of equality. So the only sense in which we can be equal, because metaphysically we are not, is equality of rights, which manifests itself politically. One of the ways it manifests is equality before the law. The only way equality applies to human being is that we're free. So what, what are the socialists trying to do? What is the left trying to do? What is the attempt by the left involved? If we, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take a metaphysical fact that we're all equal, that we're all unequal, that we're all different, and use force in order to change it. At least change its external manifestation. So they know they can't deal with, um, I don't know, Talents. They'd love to be able to deal with talent. They'd love to be able to destroy people who are talented, right? To make us equal, should have said destroy. To make us equal, right? Because they don't. They don't. They're not talking about destruction. They're just talking about making. They would love to all of us to have the same talent. I mean, it's sad if you're a leftist. That some people have less talent, and some people have more talent. But what's the only way you can make people equal in talent? So I like to use the example of basketball, right? I'm pretty bad at basketball. Uh, Michael Jordan, you guys, uh, maybe I use a modern, who plays basketball today? LeBron James, LeBron James, you know? Do you guys know basketball? Maybe she do soccer, <laughs> football. Anyway, how do you make me and Michael Jordan the same in basketball? How do you make us equal? Because I'm terrible and he's like the best player who ever lived. How do you make us the same? By making a LeBron James scribble? Yes. So, you laugh, it's the only way. Because I, you know, I could train every day, all day, shooting the basketball, and he'd still be better than me, right? So you can't make me as good as him. So the only way is to make him as bad as me. How do you make him as bad as I am? By breaking his legs. And if you watched me play, you'd know that that's not enough. You have to break his arms too, right? So you have to break his legs and arms to make it equal to me. So that's, that's how you do it in talent. And that's even, you know, even the hardcore egalitarians, even hardcore, you know, people who believe in equality find that a little upsetting. A little, not too much, but a little upsetting. That you're breaking people's bones. So what do they advocate in terms of what kind of equality do they advocate for? Because they think it's more palatable, because they think it's more, you know, it's nicer. What kind of equality? Yeah, financial equality. It's all about equality of income, equality of wealth. So how do you make us equal financially? 
taxation. So you take money from some people and you give it to other people, right? So you take money from people who have a lot and you give it to money, they give the money to people who have a little. Now, what's the difference between taxation and breaking your legs and arms? Taxation is legal. Okay, we can pass a law that allows us to break the arms and legs of great basketball players or whoever we feel like it, right? I mean, the legality of it is just an, you know, what we've agreed is legal. We can change what's legal. I mean, slavery used to be legal. Smoking used to be legal. It's not physical. It's not. Try not paying your taxes. <laughs> what happens? They come and they take from you. And they, they take you in jail at the same time, but they confiscate. What's confiscating? Is that physical? It's, it's not on your body. Okay, so it's not on your body. There's no blood. There's no tissue. There are no bones breaking. Right? But think about what taxes are. Think about what taxes are. Where does the money that you have come from? Where does the money you have come from that you're taxed on? Where does it come from? I mean, assume you're not students and the answer is not my parents <laughs> or the state. But where does the money you come when you pay taxes come from? This is going to sound wrong, but you rent out your body for another one. You rent out your body. Okay, but the money doesn't come from other people using your body. Unless you're a prostitute. No, no, no. Yes, yes. Or maybe. <laughs> why are people willing to rent your body? I mean, it's not really your body, but why are people willing to pay you? For your labor, for your thinking, for your skill, for your talent, for your ability, right? They're willing to pay you for what you produce, for your time and your effort. So where does the money come from? From time and effort. Right? So, you know, you spend 8, 10, in America we spend half 10 to 12 hours a day working. And we get paid for it. And the money is compensation for our time, for the use of our body and mind during that period of time, right? So, what is taxes? What is taxes? If the money you're paying is a product of your time and your effort, what are the taxes you're paying? The time and effort. Right? You're paying. So if, you're, if your tax rate is 50%, half the time that you're sweating away that you know they're using your body and your mind, you're using your body and your mind to pay somebody else. Half the time. Half the time is for you. Right? You get a benefit from the effort and work that you're doing. And half the time is for somebody else. Now is that that much different than breaking arms and legs? What's more valuable to you than time? You, you guys are young, so, you know, with advances in medicine, if they continue and, you know, uh, if your healthcare system will provide them to you, uh, you know, you got a good chance of living to be 90. But that's it, there's 90, 90 years. Half of that time and effort is gonna go to you, and half of that time and effort is gonna go to somebody else. Now, I, I would be happy to have my arms and legs broken if you give me half my time back. Uh, the argument of the left of taxes are not just going on this one that are used for uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's, I, I'm not arguing about how they're going to be used. We can talk about how they're used. The point is, it doesn't matter how they're used. The point is to get them, they have to break my legs and, and arms. There's no difference between that. Now, you could argue that breaking arms and legs doesn't serve any purpose. And I could argue that taxes don't serve any purpose too, and we'll get to that. But it's the same thing. Violence is being used against me. My time, my life is being taken away from me in the name of what? 
in the name of equality, put aside that part of the taxes that are going for roads and factories. We can deal with that later. But a big chunk of my taxes are going to what? Are going to give to other people. Are being taken from me and handed to other people so that we establish some utopia of equality. Now, when did this utopia, when, when does this utopia actually exist? When are we, when are we equal? When are we relatively equal when it comes to income? Relatively, we're never completely equal. But when has humanity achieved real, you know, sustained, long-term, relative equality? Well, everybody was pretty much the same. What's that? I mean, there's always been some people who had, but let's say, there's never ever been a period when 98% of the population was pretty much at the same level. For most of human history. For most of human history. How many people were poor 250 years ago? I mean, dirt poor. Because they lived in the dirt. I mean, literally. How many people on the planet 250 years ago were dirt poor. 95, 6, 7%. Few aristocrats at the top. Most people were very, very poor and pretty equal. The distribution of wealth, I mean, a few had a bit of luck here, but everybody else was pretty much the same. Average wealth in human history has been basically flat for 10,000 years. Not only have they been equal at any given point in time, but for generations they've been the same. I mean, you get some variation here and there during some periods of history, but if you look at a graph of wealth per capita on the planet for the last 10,000 years, it's like this. It's pretty much flat. And then it goes like that. I mean, like that. And it happens about 250 years ago. And when it does that, what happens to the inequality? Grows massively. Massive inequality. A lot of people become rich. Some people become middle class. Some people stay poor, but the poor all what? Are they the same poor as they were 250 years ago? No, they're much better off, right? The rich 250 years ago, well, never mind 250 years ago. Would you rather be like lower middle class today, maybe even poor today, or rich 70 years ago? <laughs> no internet, just to remind you. No phones, right? No phones. In, you know, some electricity, washing machines. I don't think there are washing machines. Air conditioning, well, you don't need air conditioning over here, but in California it's important. I'd rather be lower middle class than rich 70 years ago. I'd rather be poor in America today than rich 70 years ago. The poor live a better life today in America than the rich did 70 years ago. They almost all own, own automobiles, which 70 years ago they would, the rich would have had, but 100 years ago the rich didn't have automobiles. 150 years ago the rich didn't have electricity, because nobody had electricity. Electricity is pretty cool, even if you're poor. So what happens with the Industrial Revolution and with the growth of capitalism is that inequality goes up Boom, it explodes, right? We were equal before capitalism. Relatively equal. I mean, we don't have to go 250 years ago. What's the most equal place on the planet today from an income perspective? What's that? North Korea. Yeah, North Korea is a good example. Huh. Um, but what continent has the most equality? Africa. Everybody's poor. I mean, not everybody. There are a few people who are rich, but almost everybody else is poor. That is the natural condition of human beings. Human beings naturally, without freedom, without industrialization, without capitalism, human beings are poor. And we're equal. That's history. The Industrial Revolution capitalism create inequality. Fantastic. That should be celebrated. Because that inequality is a consequence of what? What produces that inequality? What? Welfare. 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 
reduces the inequality? Yeah, the richness. But where did the richness come from? How did this inequality happen? How did the rich get so rich? How did the middle class get created? Where did it come from? They create value. Yeah, by creating value. So the way inequality gets created is a long time ago, we, we were born with different talents, but we had no way to use them. Like Michael Jordan, if he'd been born 250 years ago, it wouldn't matter that he's incredibly talented in basketball. Even if he practiced every day, nobody would pay him for it. He couldn't make a lot of money, and he'd have no stage on which to play, because there was no such thing as basketball. Capitalism creates an opportunity for all of us to take our talents and to use them to create values. And some people create values that have huge material value, if you will, to other people, and therefore they become rich. Other people create values that don't have a lot of material value to other people, and they don't become rich. I, you know, teachers, teachers are not worth a lot of money. They're not. You're not willing to pay teachers a lot. Not as much as a software engineer. Software engineer is rarer, and it creates more material wealth than teachers do. Teachers make less. And they choose to make less by becoming teachers. It's a choice they make. But capitalism creates this incredible opportunity for all of us to express our unequalness, which is not a word, but it doesn't matter. You know, the fact that we're different, the fact that we have different talents, the fact that we have different passions, different interests, different skills, that we do different things, that we can create values in different ways. And somebody who creates lots of values becomes wealthy. How, does, how did Bill Gates, how did Bill, everybody know Bill Gates is, right? How did Bill Gates make $70 billion for himself? How did he make it? What? He started a company. Lots of people start companies. He created software. He sold the software, right? And the software was so successful that what? Everybody had to have one, right? And he sold them, let's say he sold them for $100. I think that's what they used to go for, right? DOS or Windows or Word or whatever it was. If you paid $100 for it, right? How much was the software worth to you when you bought it for $100? How much was it worth to you? If it was $100, you wouldn't bother to get out, right? You wouldn't bother to make the exchange. If it's exactly equal, why do I care? You keep the $100, so I can get the software. It doesn't matter to me. The reason you give money for the beer, how much does the beer cost? Two euros. Two euros. How much is the beer worth to you? <laughs> <laughs> It's a better example of software, obviously. I got your attention. You don't care about software. Beer you care about. How much is the beer worth to you? If you're willing to give up two, do two euros, how much is it worth to you? This is the most fundamental principle in all of economics, right? If you're paying two euros for beer, how much is the beer worth to you? More than two euros. Because otherwise you wouldn't have given up the two. Having two euro in your pocket is worth less to you than having beer in your belly. <laughs> now, I don't like beer. I know that's heresy in Belgium. So to me, it's not. So I don't buy it. Right? I keep my two euro because it's more valuable. Two euro in my pocket is worth more to me than the, than the beer in my belly. Right? So when somebody sells you a beer, who lost? Who gained? Everybody. He gained, uh, who, who sold the beer, whoever sold the beer gained, because they're making a profit, right? Because they bought the beer for a for euro, and they're selling it to you for two. So they're better off, and you're better off, because you have beer in the belly instead of two euro in your pocket. Two euro in your pocket is worth less to you than the beer in the belly, right? So the only way to make money in a, in a free market is by offering people a value that they value more than you do. I would be a great beer sell seller because beer is not worth much to me. I wouldn't be tempted to drink it. So Bill Gates makes a lot of money by selling you software for $100 a piece. And all of you are what because of that? Better off. 
Because so, you got something for hundred dollars that's actually worth to you more than hundred dollars. How much more than hundred dollars? You want to guess? A lot. Think about what life would be without Microsoft. It's hard to imagine because it's so embedded in your life. Every piece of software is worth to an individual tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And all Microsoft charged you was a hundred. You got the unbelievable deal of a lifetime. How many people of the world were affected by Microsoft? How many people's lives were better because of Microsoft? A million? More? A billion? I think it's somewhere between six to seven billion. Because almost everybody on the planet's life is better because of Microsoft. It's better because we have computers that all talk to each other, we have networks, we have software that's intuitive. That wouldn't have happened if not for Microsoft or somebody like Microsoft creating it. And Bill Gates made $70 billion. How? By making the world a much better place to live. By creating a value that everybody paid for. He made money. You made money. Not money. You made success. Some of it turned into money. Lots of millionaires made money off of their Microsoft products. Most of them. Okay. So the only way you create wealth is by offering other people a value, i.e. making other people's lives better. So yes, the rich are way up here, very unequal. But the way they got here is by taking these people down here and pulling them up. It's the very essence of what a marketplace is. A marketplace is the creation of value that you sell to other people, that you trade with other people. And a trade is, by definition, win-win. You both won, right? With the beer, everybody won. Nobody lost. Microsoft, everybody won. Nobody lost. You win if you're selling because you're making a profit, hopefully. And the buyer wins because he's getting something he wanted, hopefully. You can make mistakes. You can buy lemons. Right? You can buy bad products. But those are mistakes. You enter the transaction with the intention of winning. So trade is win-win. So what's the problem with inequality? That people are getting in the public the level. It's the software. It's, it's, it's uh, automatization and people lose their job. So the people must go on welfare and therefore we must get taxation. So it's, it's fascinating the fact that since the 1980s, when the software came into being, the number of jobs in the world has increased dramatically. Nobody has lost his job because of software. Not an aggregate. And it's, software creates many, many, many more jobs than it eliminates. And this is true of technology throughout history. At every point in technological history, since the late 1700s, People have said, oh, if we adopt this technology, people will lose their jobs. And at every step in the Industrial Revolution, now in the Information Revolution, more jobs are created than were lost. And this continues. I mean, think of the millions and millions and millions of jobs that, 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 that exist today that didn't exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And you can see this, for example, by the fact, the simple fact, that China has gone from a country where everybody was a subsistence farmer to a country where you've got hundreds of millions of people producing stuff in jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. And they haven't replaced the jobs in America. Unemployment in America is relatively speaking small and it's caused almost 100% by government. It is. I could eliminate unemployment in the United States within a week. Reducing unemployment is easy. It's easy. Nobody wants to do it, but it's an easy thing to do. All you have to do is, is provide the right incentives to, to the, for, the, for the creation of jobs, which means no, you know, significantly less regulations and lower taxes, and jobs would appear like that. And it always works. Whenever it's tried in history, it always works. And it's easy to do if you have the political stomach, and the political will, and the political ideology to actually do it. It's fascinating that you use China as an example because it's a very strong communist home state. So, this notion of we're getting away from inequality, but that's fine. 
Although China is a good example of inequality, again, China was very equal 40 years ago. Today, there's massive inequality in China, but they're much better off. <clears throat> much better off. Inequality is a sign of a vibrant, thriving, successful, prosperous, wonderful state of affairs. Now, China's a mixture, that's right. And that's why it's only partially successful. It's still got hundreds of millions of people in poverty. But notice which parts of China are successful. You have to go to China to actually see this. The parts of China that are thriving, that are booming, that everybody's moving to, where cities are being created from scratch, are those part of China where from an economics perspective, the government has said, you can do whatever you want. In Southeast China, the area surrounding Hong Kong, uh, Guangzhou province, I think it's called, there are no regulations on business, or very little. Uh, uh, what was this? Uh, Steve Wynn, who's a business friend in America, owns the Wynn Casinos in Las Vegas, has said that it's much easier to do business in China. It's far less regulated in China than it is in the United States, and I believe it. So when you take an area like that part of China and say, okay, free markets, we'll even pretend you have property rights, because they just pretend in China you don't really have property rights, but the government pretends you have property rights. Bam! Human productivity explodes, wealth creation implodes, and inequality goes through the roof. Cool. In those areas in China, where the state still controls everything, where state enterprises are the major source of jobs, it's flat. There's very little wealth creation, there's very little growth, and indeed those are the parts of China that are, gonna, that are dragging its economy down right now. Because state-owned businesses don't function. They don't run well. What's that? The train from Belgium. Uh, trains in Belgium are a good example or a bad example? Of <laughs> bad example of functioning well. <laughs> yes. I, uh, trains everywhere, because trains, for whatever reason, I'll, ask, uh, I'll get you, trains, for whatever reason, uh, have been nationalized uh, throughout a lot of the world, and they, they're all lousy. Yes. Uh, about China, you said those areas that are la like, uh, like three have the biggest um, growth here. Those areas you talk about are the areas that historically are the wealthiest, and you have other areas in China that have the um, state of autonomous region, so they are about the same as Hong Kong, and they are really poor, just because they, they, don't, they also have the, so let's the take historical home. background of being poor, because they are um, like Tibet, for example, because it's just the mountains, they don't have anything. So that's just, that's not true. And let me give you some examples. Hong Kong. What's the history of Hong Kong? It was a part of Before. It, before it was part of Great Britain. When Britain first showed up about 100 years ago, what was in Hong Kong? Nothing. It was a fishing village. What did the British bring to Hong Kong? <laughs> Originally. Culture. What did they bring to Hong Kong? What's that? Knowledge. They brought some knowledge, but that was Hong Kong, just to, just to contrast, it was a fishing village 75 years ago. Today, it has a population of 7.5 million people. And the average, the average uh, per capita GDP, the GDP per person, is equivalent to that of the United States. So incredibly wealthy, right? What happened during those 75 years? There's no history of wealth there. There's no natural resources, zero natural resources. It's not even a good place to start a city because it's on this very steep hill. So it's very difficult to build. There's a tiny little bit of flat land. So it's worse than Tibet. What did the British bring to Hong Kong? They brought one thing that made all the difference. Why Hong Kong? There were a thousand places they could have. But what, what, what made trade in Hong Kong favorable? What they brought to Hong Kong was property rights. What they brought to Hong Kong was freedom, respect for individuals. What they brought to Hong Kong was, was equality before the law. Yeah, but you, what do you say about the other parts about where now there is also the same, but... So take Tibet. Take, take Beijing and take Tibet. Take Tibet. No, no, I agree. So take Tibet. Why is Tibet not developed? Because it's poor? 
Lots of places. Well, so let me finish the, exa the example, then I'll get to Tibet. Because you're right, there's a, there's a huge difference. Take the area around Hong Kong. Uh, there's there's a, a, a city called uh, Dongguan, uh, Guangzhou, that whole area. That whole area used to be dirt poor. There was nothing there. Indeed, Dongguan, which I visited about eight years ago, didn't exist in 1986. There was no city, there was nothing. It was just flat land. Today, eight million people live in Dongguan. Right. What, there's no history of wealth in the Guangzhou province. So what created the wealth there? What created the wealth there was that China went there and said, this area here, you have property rights, we're leaving you alone, you can create and build whatever you want, individual initiative, and people from all over China who were allowed to do it, because Chinese are just an autocracy, it's, it's, it's government control. All the people went there who had any kind of entrepreneurial spirit and they built. And you should see these cities, they're unbelievable cities. There's skyscrapers everywhere. The biggest mall, shopping mall in the world is in Dongguan, China, a place you've never heard of, where up until a few years ago, 50% of all the shoes in the world were made in this one city. That's because of freedom. Now, why is Tibet, and, and not just Tibet, a lot of Western China, why are they so poor? Why are they so poor? It's a landlocked area with uh, difficult transport. So, I'm trying to think of a good example of a landlocked area that doesn't exhibit that phenomenon. Um, Switzerland. Switzerland. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was going blank for a minute, I was thinking Kansas. Um, natural resources don't matter one iota in the big scheme of things. In the historical scheme, wealth does not come from natural resources. If they did, then the Spanish Empire, the Spanish Empire would have creamed the British and the French. They had all their gold from South America, but it doesn't matter. Because if you have a lousy economic system and a lousy political system, the gold goes right through you. It doesn't stick. It doesn't create wealth. It doesn't generate real wealth. It's not natural resources that matter. What matters is freedom. Tibet in particular is not allowed to be successful economically because the Chinese want to suppress it. They want to press the Tibetans. They don't want the Tibetans to have an idea of independence. So they oppress them. They don't have property rights. They don't have contract rights. They don't have the freedoms that you have and don't want. Now, the same is true of Western China, which is, by the way, largely Islamic, and they're afraid of them. So they haven't expanded the freedoms to Western China. To Western China. They have allowed certain regions. You can take a map of China, and you can say where they allow freedom, check, 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 you see economic growth there, except for Beijing. Beijing is successful, why? Because they tax all the other successful places, and they steal their money, and they bring it into Beijing. But all the success, the production, the, the, the wealth creation is happening in those areas that are left free. And the areas that are poor are the ones where there's no freedom. The correlation throughout history, there is a correlation throughout history, between freedom and wealth, not natural resources and wealth, freedom and wealth. Is Saudi Arabia a wealthy country? Has a lot of natural resources. Is it a wealthy country? Yes. No. For 90% of the people, it's dirt, they're dirt poor. I mean, the king has all the wealth. The country is not wealthy. There's no middle class in Saudi Arabia. The people are poor, in spite of the natural resources. Isn't that the most unequal system where one person has everything and the rest has nothing? Yes, and, and you know that that's not because of capitalism, that's always because somebody establishes themselves as king or pope. Popes are pretty wealthy, always have been. Uh, or, or some form of dictator and sucks up everybody else's wealth for their benefit. Right? That creates, if you will, the lifestyle. But, but if you look at Gini coefficients, which are the coefficients that measure wealth scientifically, Saudi Arabia scores low because so many of the population are down here that the inequality of this one king doesn't put the coefficient up enough. But uh, the United States scores uh, more bad than, than India, for example. Yes, but in my view, yeah, of course it does. Good. 
Uh, mind you, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. A, 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 high, a high GD coefficient means there's a lot of inequality. Uh, as I've explained so far, I think that's good. Because there's no accident that America is much wealthier than India. We're freer, and therefore more wealth is created, and therefore there's more variety, and there's more differentiation between the very successful, the medium successful, and the not so successful. But I would rather be poor in America than middle class in India. So I'd rather be at the bottom of the coefficient uh, of the, of the uh, you know, graph in, 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 in America, because the whole thing is being bought up. Yep. Yeah. But I don't think that America is that wealthy because they have like a um, debt of $15 trillion or something. Uh, yeah, but the US economy is enormous. So, I mean, I'm not saying America is ideal. America is terrible, right? So the government debt is amazing. But America is very wealthy. Americans are very wealthy. The standard of living in America far exceeds the standard of living in Europe. Well, if they have such an amount of debt, aren't they like living above their standards? Well, the government is living above its standards. The government is spending a lot of money on wasting a lot of money. But Americans don't have that much more debt than other people around the world. And it, there's no reason to believe Americans would default on that debt because they make a lot of money. I believe that um, China is, um, is, is, is like buying uh, they bonds or something from America. Yes, the Chinese buy American bonds. But why do, why do the Chinese buy American bonds? Because they have dollars. How do they get dollars? Because Americans are so rich that we buy all this stuff from China. From China. Right? So we're buying Chinese goods because we have money. The Chinese then have dollars and they put them back into the US economy. Otherwise, where would they get dollars from? Yep. Uh, but if you say that the creation of wealth and uh, the increase of wealth goes together, uh, I, for example, in the 1960s, 1970s, Jim Crow since all around the world were dropping, like, for example, Christmas. Sorry. So in the 1950s or 60s, Gini coefficients dropped, and you saw an increase uh, in equality for a while, right? Uh, it's because post World War II, right? A lot of these, a lot of a lot of the ways in which wealth is distributed got crushed. So, for example, in Europe, you know, basically Europe was flattened. So a lot of the a lot of the assets of Europe came down. So a lot of the measurements coming out of World War II. Thank you. I'm also going to do this, it's getting hot again. So first of all, a lot of the measures get distorted right after World War II because of war. But second, I don't know that that's a good thing. What was the main economic activity during the 40s and 50s, particularly in Europe? What was the main so-called wealth creation that was going on in Europe during the 50s? In the early 60s. Reconstruction. reconstruction. So reconstruction is not wealth creation. Reconstruction is wealth recreation. When did wealth started to be created anew? New wealth, new assets, new products, new goods. When was real investment going into the new? It starts in the 60s and really accelerates in the 80s, right, with, with technology. So, and then the Gini coefficients explode, right? They, they start going up in the 80s, all over, the, all over Western Europe, all over Europe and the United States. So reconstruction, is reconstruction, um, do you guys know, you know what the broken window fallacy is? Yeah. yeah. You guys get excited, broken window fallacy you like, huh? I mean, part of this is the broken window fallacy, right? G, do you know the GDP in the United States, gross domestic product in the United States, went way up in 1942, 1943, 1944? And yet, what happened to standard of living in America during those years? What happened to standard of living during World War II in America? Just guess. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, think about it. Half the male population is overseas fighting a war. Thousands of them are dying. Uh, you know, what you're building are tanks, not machines, tanks are not exactly productive things, they're not consumables, right, they're not things that make life better. 
So standard of living was dropping, GDP was going up. So the way we measure economic activity is completely distorted by the broken window fallacy. You know what the, does anybody know what the broken window fallacy is? You know, you break the windows, that creates economic activity, but all you get at the end is a window. And that's, a, that's not real economic activity. Wars are not real economic activity. Reconstruction, you need to do it. And, but it's not wealth creation where entrepreneurs and innovators create new ideas and wealth. That, that is what creates inequality. Because, again, we go back to the metaphysical fact that we're not equal. And all the income inequality is, is a reflection of that. It's a reflection of the fact that we're not equal. We're not equal in talent. We're not, we don't equally work hard. Some of us drink more beer than we should. Some of us are more responsible. Right? We're different. And that is reflected in how much money we make. Some of us make different choices. I chose to be a teacher. I've got a PhD in finance. Could have gone to Wall Street. Chose to be a teacher. I chose to be poorer. I don't care. I mean, one of the things that I find fascinating is that the capitalist side, my side, doesn't care that much about money. So people, what, let me ask you this question. In terms of real inequality, in terms of lifestyle, life quality, what's the difference between me and Bill Gates? Bill Gates is 10,000 times richer than I am. I think that's right, maybe more. 10,000 or more times richer than I am. But in terms of the way we live our lives, how big of a difference is there between me and Bill Gates? Not much. We both surf the internet at about the same speed. We both fly private airplanes across the country. I happen to share mine with 300 people, and he does it by himself. But I can go anywhere in the United States. I can afford to go pretty much anywhere. He can afford to go anywhere. Um, he has a bigger house than I do, but you know what? I have a pretty big house. Um, I've got a really, I've got a nice German car. I don't know what he drives. Might be German, it might be a Rolls Royce, who knows? But it's the same car that gets you from point A to point B. Even if it's Toyota, it gets you from point A to point B. How many, what was the difference between, say, in lifestyle? My argument would be that in life, he's probably going to be live. I mean, if you look at medical technology, you know, maybe he'll live a few months more than I do, but not much. I have the same access to medical technology he has. It's not that expensive, and I have insurance, and they cover it. So what's the difference between me and Bill Gates? In terms of actual living, there's not much inequality between me and Bill Gates. But take, take, um, take China. Take the difference in inequality between a, a, a peasant and, and some uh, government bureaucrat who, through blaming the system, has made a fortune, right? There's a huge difference in the lifestyles they have. The peasant can't go anywhere. He needs to get a permit to go anywhere. Or take life 300 years ago. You, you can't leave your village in China. You can't cross state lines in China without getting a permit. Even today, they, they control who flows east because they don't want too many people flowing east. There's lots of illegal immigration within migration within China, but it's illegal. There, there, there are millions of people living in Shanghai who don't have permits to live in Shanghai. But it's they control it or they try. But take take 300 years ago. If you were a peasant, how far could you go? As far as your legs would carry you, not very far, because you didn't own a horse, never mind an automobile or plane. How far could you go as an aristocrat? As far as other people would carry you, or as far as a horse would take you, I mean, the distances were vast. There's no difference between how far I can go and Bill Gates can go. So, in terms of quality of life, in a sense, there's more equality today than there was back then. Even though in terms of equality of income, we're much more unequal today than we were back then. Because even at a minimal level of income in the West, you have access to amazing wealth. Because of capitalism. There was another question. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. But, uh, if we go back a little bit. Uh, sure. Uh, and, and the talk today, uh, you were talking about that. Uh, thanks to great uh, innovation yes. technology and yes. capitalism by uh, Internet House. Uh, actually, um, there are property rights in Tibet. And uh, 
uh, there's even no taxation at all. So the states, the central state pays all the government expenses and all education that's uh, from the pockets of the East Coast, in fact. So how do you explain the difference in welfare? So, again, I would bet you anything, and you know, I'd have to go uh, and, and check Wikipedia as well. Um, the differences are differences in freedom. They're not differences in anything else. Uh, I mean, it could be differences in culture. But if you, if you see, if you look to natural resources, yeah. for example, I think the, uh, in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century, yeah. right, where is the wealth rate? There is not really a, a cultural difference or a difference in, in economic policy. Uh, the wealth rate around uh, coal mines and steel mines. So, for natural resources, uh, also, uh, at least in the capital state, well, uh, there, would, there, there was more natural resources in Russia than there were in Germany. Of course, but it was a capitalist. But it was a capitalist. I agree with you, but you can't ignore the fact that natural resources at least oh, no. Look, capitalized uh, the, the growth of the uh, of, uh, economic system. They don't. Not in a free market. Because, look, um, you have a mine, right? The mine produces something that you then have to sell. Somebody else has to be able to create wealth so that they can buy what you're selling. But they don't have a mine or something. They have to create something that's not a mine. It doesn't matter. It's a question of what kind of wealth you create. Some people could create wealth in natural resources by mining the natural resources. Other people create wealth from ideas, from building stuff, from sewing dresses, from making shoes, right? And then you trade. I trade you my shoe for your natural resource. Who's better off? The guy with the natural resources or the guy making the shoes? I don't know. It depends on the relative supply and demand of each. The guy with the natural resources is not automatically better off than the guy making the shoes. We had, uh, I, I heard you mention that Adam Smith and yes. uh, during our dinner. Uh, and, uh, so I, I agree there's a win-win situation in, in, in trade, but you can't ignore the fact that someone can possibly win more than the other. So oh, yeah, no, more. there's relative, there's relative gain. So there's but, relative gain. So, but it's not clear that the relative gain is to the natural resources. The relative gain is to that which is more, what? More valuable, more rare, more scarce, if you will, right? And often, what's rare and scarce is the idea and the product created by an idea that it is the natural resource. And it depends on how efficient you are producing natural resources. My guess is the Germans were very efficient at it, right? Well, Relative to others. Even within Germany, uh, that was the example, of course. But even within Germany, people want to go to the, the rural region, as, uh, as it's called. Sure, no, look, I'm, I'm, in Western rural region. I'm not arguing that natural resources don't create, don't create economic activity. And if you have a free market, then the economic activity the natural resources create is a positive. And people want to go there, they work, and they create value, and they create wealth. What I am saying is the fact that you don't have natural resources in a free market does not exclude you from being able to create wealth. Okay, I agree. That's all. So what the relative is, it depends on the time, it depends on the place, it depends on the relative values of what you're producing. But natural resources in and of themselves don't give you value. They need to be combined with freedom. Not having natural resources is not a disadvantage when you're free. It's clearly a disadvantage if you're not free. I mean, the only nice thing about natural resources is if you can steal the technology, even an unfree society can get the natural resources, like Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia can't produce ideas. They don't really produce anything other than dig the ground and get the oil out, which is a technology they didn't even invent, right? That they stole. They didn't even buy it. They stole it, right? So they can still benefit from the natural resources because they happen to be on the land, even though they're not free. So that's the advantage natural resources have. They give power to autocrats. They give power to unfree societies. But if you have free societies, the advantage of natural resources is very small. Not to say there are periods in which it is an advantage, but it's very small. The essence is freedom, not the, not the natural resources. Again, Hong Kong is an example, Switzerland is an example. There are lots of examples of parts in America that have no natural resources and yet thrive. 
Yeah. Um, if you are completely free um, and you forget about the choices you make, is there any chance you will not become wealthy? Even if yes, as a, as, a, as a society as individuals, as a, as a group or as individuals. Individual. Oh yeah, absolutely. I know lots of people who are free and who are lazy. No, but if they are not lazy, they want, they want to work, they make the right choices. In a free society, yeah. if you're not lazy, if you make the right choices, if you're hardworking, then you will make a good living. And if you, you live in India? I mean, there are accidents that can happen. India is not free. But if India is not free. If India would be completely free and you live in a the Then everybody could do well. You live in a village, you no. speak a language no one knows. Yes. So you're going to create a real science fiction story for me. You speak a language no one knows and? No one knows except for the rest of the village. Okay. And you want to make it in the free market. Then what do you do? Okay, so here's an experiment, guys. There is no, there is no, there is no, um, there is no, uh, on education. There's no free education. For you because the government doesn't provide it. So what do you do? So what do you do? School yourself. What's that? School yourself. Yeah, you, 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 you figure out how to... Uh, in a village in England, I don't know who would say this in Dutch. So what do you do? You live in a village in India, nobody speaks your language, and, and the village is stuck. It's like in a remote place, and it has no natural resources. And they can barely feed themselves, and there's no internet, there's no electricity, there's no running water. What do you do? Throw help from the US. <laughs> <laughs> Imagination, what do you do? It's simple. You pack your bags and you leave. Yeah. What did you do? What did Europeans do when they lived in, in oppressive regimes and they were good poor in little villages in the middle of Poland, in the middle of Russia, in the middle of Germany? What did they do? They packed their bags, got on the boat, and went to America. <laughs> okay, they killed the Indians. But, but they created massive amounts of wealth and they lived free and happily ever after. Uh, you know, talk about the Indians, separate topic. Uh, unrelated. The point is, if you're in India and you're poor, you pack your bags and you move to a place where there is work. You figure out the language just like those Poles figured out English. And by the way, the, the, the people who immigrated to America in the 19th century knew how much English. Zero. They had how many years of education? Zero. They knew what skills? Some farming. In the, in the, in the Ukraine, not farming like they do in England, in, in the UK, most of them did, in the US, and most of them didn't become farmers. They figured it out. You go, you work hard, you try hard. You know, the Jews who came to America in the late 19th century, I'll talk about my own people, right? The Jews who came to America in the late 19th century were ignorant uneducated, poor, with no English skills and no abilities, and within one and a half generations, they were middle class. How did they do it? Because they were free. And it was their safety net in America in those days to protect them. No, there was no safety net. The government gave them nothing. They came, they found jobs that paid very little, they fed themselves, they got better at those jobs, they got a little bit more money, they sent their kids to school, they paid for the school, their kids did even better, and their kids became middle class, or their grandkids became middle class. There's no secret to how to make money enough to live on, it's the work up in a free society, you know, you know, in the mixed economy we have today. It can be hard, but that's because the government is constraining the number of jobs. They're constraining entrepreneurial ability, they're constraining capital, they're constraining wealth creation. I give you another example. Like, sure. uh, Finland is not an example of a laissez-faire economy or doesn't have low social or environmental standards. But if you look at per thousands of people, they have the highest patent rates uh, in the world and they have the most equal uh, schooling system as well. How can you explain that? Relative to what? So I'm not sure what the what, what relative. Finland is relatively free. It has property rights. It allows people to have ideas and to start businesses. It's actually easier to start a business in Scandinavia today than it is in the United States. There's less regulation, more redistribution of wealth, but less regulation. Um, you know, Finland's a relatively free country. Now, there's massive redistribution of wealth, which I think is terrible because it means people's legs and arms are being broken every day. 
So but people work in spite of that. But yeah. if you see, they have much more patents per uh, thousand uh, citizens than they have in America. In America is more deregulated, less taxation. Uh, no, no, I'm saying America is not more deregulated. America is more regulated than Scandinavia. But in what, in, in what kind is more regulated? Okay, so, so there's an index that comes out every year of, of economic freedom. How free a country is from regulatory, either they take taxes and they cut all these things in. Anybody know what number one is? The least, the, the most free economy in the world? What's that? No, it's actually Hong Kong, Singapore, always number one and two. From a purely economic perspective, Singapore is not particularly free if you want to chew gum or something like that. Uh, but from an economic perspective, they're very, they're very free. You know where the United States is today? 18. You know who's ahead of the United States? Countries like Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, New Zealand, Australia. So the difference in economic freedom from a regulatory perspective between the United States and the rest of the world is not is shrunk dramatically over the last few years. Now second, the United States is massive. You're taking a, a country with 300 million people from incredibly diverse backgrounds, incredibly diverse educational levels, Right? Where the government is involved in education, let's let's be straight, right? This is not private sector education, this is government education. Government education is awful. When it's delivered to three, in any case it's awful. Even in Finland it's not that good. It's just better than American education, which is not, you know, it's not something to brag about. Finland has one of the highest grades on the PISA test. Oh, no, no. Relative to all other public education system, it's the best. I'm saying if you had real education, free market education, if you had competition, if you had if you had innovation, why does everybody want to innovate for this stupid little thing, right? A, a little new app. All the brain power in the world is going to devising apps for this. I'd like to see all that brain power go devising new educational products. They would if education was private, it wasn't funded by the government. And then you'd see what education could be. I mean, imagine if the state built a phone. No, I'm serious. Think about it. Instead of Steve Jobs doing this, imagine a committee of the of, of, of the Belgian state was responsible for building this. What would it look like? Oh, the Finnish state. Let's take Finland because it's a good country. It would look terrible. So, so let's put aside education for a second. Um, America has a lousy public education system. It has 300 million people. It has a very diverse population from all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, it has a horrible history of racism, for example, that's still encrypted. It. it has in, an entitlement system that, that is, is very destructive in America, much more destructive in America than I think in other places for a variety of historical reasons. Uh, yeah, I mean, the areas, if I took Silicon Valley, there are more patents per capita than Finland. For that matter, uh, Finland might have more patents, but more. you know where there are more entrepreneurs, more businesses started per capita than any country in the world? Israel. Particularly in high tech. Right? Now, compared to the United States, not compared to Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley has more. So, America has a lot of different things going on that make it very difficult to compare to a homogeneous population in a very small country with a very small population, right? How much? How many people live in Finland? Five million. Five million. Less than live in, in, in my metropolitan area. Yeah, but that doesn't matter if you work hard and you do your best. Everyone gets what they deserve. Yeah, they do. So, so in Finland, in Finland, they get what they deserve, and then the government cuts and chops their legs off and takes it and gives it to somebody else. And I bet you that the people who work the hardest in Finland, if you lower immigration barriers. I always, I always want this. I, I'd love somebody to do this experiment. Of course, the politicians would never let you. But this is the experiment I want. Take any country in, 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 in Scandinavia, which everybody thinks is heaven, and you, you say, from now on, there's free immigration between Finland and America. Where do you think people will go? From America to Finland or from Finland to America? I mean, the entrepreneurs, the, the people who hold the patents, the, the really hardworking, smart ones, where would they go? They don't go to America. I'm, I guarantee it. And very few Americans will go to film. So, in terms of, you know, in terms of differences, uh, it's hard to compare these small countries to a country like America, but in terms of the amount of actual innovation that happens, um, 
most Finnish country here, small companies ultimately want to become American companies because that's where the market is. That's where the size is. How did we get on this? I can't even remember. What's that? Patents. What about patents? They have more patents in Finland than the United States per capita. That's right. Inequality, or should we take more questions? What's that? I've got more to say on inequality if you want to hear it. But <laughs> so, so, in my view, inequality that's generated for freedom, that's generated for capitalism, is something that should be celebrated. It's something good. Any attempt and this is, this is, I think, a crucial point. Any attempt to reduce inequality violates the one type of equality that is legitimate. What's the one type of equality we said before is legitimate? Equality before the law, equality of rights, equality of freedom. But how do we, how do we make things more equal? By doing what? By taking from some people and giving to others. But that's treating them unequally. That's coercing some, violating some people's rights, reducing some people's freedom, taking the time and effort of some people and giving it to other people. So some people have more rights than others, supposedly by the system. Because you're rich, you don't have a right to all your money. If you're poor, you have a right to all your money. But if you're rich, you don't have a right to all your money. That's not equal before the law. That's not equality of rights. That's not equality of freedom. It's a violation of political freedom, of political equality, which is the only legitimate form of equality in my view. Yeah. But if you are rich, you are more free than the poor ones. Like you have a better lawyer. What does freedom mean? What, is, what does the word freedom mean? When we talk about freedom, what are we talking about? Freedom from what? Freedom from what? Coercion. From coercion. Freedom means freedom from coercion. In political sense, freedom means freedom from coercion. If you live in a good country, I'm not saying all countries are like this, no country today is like this, but in a proper political system where you have equality of rights, the poor person and the rich person are both free from coercion. The fact that the rich person has more options doesn't make the poor person less free. I know that you're taught that freedom is related to wealth, but that's just not true. There's no relationship between freedom and wealth. Freedom is freedom from coercion. And the number one coercive force in the political reality we live in is what? Who coerces more than anybody else? The state. The state coerces. And who do they coerce more? Poor people or rich people? They coerce rich people much more. There's a lot more to coerce them, to coerce from them. Rich people are less free than poor people. Now, nobody's free because we're all being coerced all the time by the state. But it's not true that poverty reduces your freedom in a truly free country, in a capitalist country. I want to go more to the, the fundamental thing about the coercion thing. So it's really important to build up the ideal you were explaining, but what about coercion in uh, raising a child? What about people who need leaders who can take the decision uh, themselves and really, even with education or a... Uh, okay, so let's take, let's take those two examples. Because if you raise a child, you need coercion. You need to coerce children, there's no question. Um, what about adults? Let me start with the adults and then go to the children. Uh, what about adults who are just too stupid? Just too stupid to think for themselves. Or how many? Uh, what percentage of people are too stupid to do it for themselves? Oh, yeah, you don't want to use the word stupid. It offends you. Use another word. But that's the implication. They can't think for themselves. But I, you know, I mean, we're not all leaders. We are not all. Uh, we're, not, we're not all. We're all. Uh, most of people, actually, most people are some kind of a product of their circumstances, of their 
the media, the you know, the, the big companies. So I mean, this goes to the to the very core of your view of human nature. Um, my view of human nature is that everybody is capable of making decisions about taking care of themselves. Doesn't mean everybody exercises that. Some people are lazy and they don't want to think. But what makes man unique is the fact that he is the rational animal. The, the thing that makes individuals unique. And whatever IQ level you have, I'm above a certain minimal where you really are deficient and you really can't make decisions. And you can talk about those people in a minute. But that's a tiny fraction of the population. Most people, from whatever IQ it is up, have the capacity to think rationally about life and to make choices and to make value judgments about what's good for them. Many of them, particularly in the world we live in today, don't do it. Partially because we don't expect them to do it. Because we say, don't think, here's a check. And by the way, you're not doing them a favor. Do you think giving people money makes their lives better? Is, money, is life about money? What's life about? What? What's, life, what's any individual's life about or should be about? Happiness. Happiness. How do you attain happiness? How do you achieve happiness? I know it's, we're going to, how do you achieve happiness? Fear. Fear? That's called joy, and it's short-lived. Maybe that's required for happiness, but it, that, it, fear doesn't equal happiness. Usually the other way around, often the other way around. But what is happiness, where do you get happiness from? You do what you want to do. For doing what you want to do, what kind of things Lead people to be to be happy. Value. Yeah, they give value. They create value. Uh, one of the things, in my view, necessary for happiness is 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 self esteem. A sense that you are worth something. A sense that you are able. A sense that you're worthy to be on the planet. That you're living up to your own ability and your own potential. Right? A sense that you can take care of yourself. To me. We get most of our self-esteem from doing what? You guys are too young, maybe, to know this. But you get most of your self-esteem from working, from producing, from creating value. I mean, people talk about the most important thing in life is family, but it's not. How many of you, how much time do we spend with our families? I mean, if we had a, just proportionally, Americans at least, Europeans are a little different. Um, we spend 80% of our time, a non-sleeping time, at work, and 20% with family. That gives you a certain set of the, of the relative importance we place on stuff. Because work is where you challenge yourself. Work is where you set goals. Work is where you push yourself. Work is where you get your self-esteem. It gives you the confidence, the assuredness to do more, to be more successful. And that's what leads to happiness. That sense that you're worthy. That sense that you can be successful. When you hand somebody a check and say, don't work. Here, you're too stupid to work. I'm just going to give it to you, right? Because you need leaders or whatever, right? You are making sure that that person will never be happy. In my view, people who don't work are not happy. People who don't achieve are not happy. And I, you know, you could view work as a broad thing. You could be, you could raise kids as work. You know, being an artist as work. There are lots of things that are work. But if you don't create value, you're not going to be happy. By redistributing wealth, by giving people checks so that they don't work, and we give them no inducement to work, we're institutionalizing them into unhappiness. We're guaranteeing them. You're not doing them a favor. They are the victims of the welfare state. The recipients are the victims of the welfare state. Being poor, but knowing that you are taking care of your family, that you are taking care of yourself, that the money you earn, you earn, that you're not dependent on other people, creates pride and brings about happiness. Knowing that you can't take care of your family is incredibly destructive to the soul of a human being. So in my view, 99.9% .9 something like that of people are completely capable of taking care of themselves. Now children are a special category because they're developing. Yeah, because from what age someone has the right to freedom and the right to... So I, I think the state sets a certain age, 
right? Let's say it's 16, let's say it's 17, I don't know, you can, whatever you want. And then if you think that you've attained the maturity level before that, in an ideal society, you would go before the court and you would have to prove that you're mature enough to, to attain the complete freedom. But at some age, you attain it automatically. Yeah. I highlighted the importance of uh, the work. Yeah. But uh, what are uh, free market solutions to uh, the well being of people who can't uh, produce enough added value? To, to, work. Uh, to be able to, uh, to have a job, uh, achieve their uh, the level of um, needs. <coughs> so, so that percentage of the population that can't produce enough to be able to live, to be able to eat. Oh, but what is the so first, how big of a number do you think that is? Say uh, half percent. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's probably less than that, but it's something far less than one percent of the population. You know, they're either born with a physical defect or there's something wrong with them that they get. So what, what is the solution to that? What is the non-coercive solution? Right, I mean, do you guys care? Would you, do, you, do you care about these people? If you do, then you can all get together and form a charity and give them money. You know? so, some of you might not care. Don't give them money. It's private charity. The point is, the fact that somebody can't take care of himself, the fact that somebody is suffering, the some fact that somebody is in need, does not create a moral obligation on you. Somebody else's pain is not automatically your problem. If you care about the person, that's a complete definition, but it's a stranger, it's not your problem. So it's not automatically something you should care about. There might be a broad sense in which we value human life. We don't want to see suffering. We're willing to put a little bit of our extra money into a pot to help them out. I think people are benevolent in that way. We value human life even when it's not doing well. Certainly, if it's a friend of yours, you would help them. Something happened, an accident or something, you would help them because they're a friend. If they're a family member, you would help them. I think the first the, the, the first people who would help children like that, adults like that, are family members. Because you have a responsibility as a parent. No matter what happens to the child, you have a responsibility. You brought him into the world. Yeah, man. What do you think uh, the outcome of the inequality in the West? The outcome of? The inequality in the West. Which side is the I mean, I think it's the most important debate in America today right now. Because it goes to the heart of what makes America different in the world. Americans so far don't care about inequality. If the left manages to cause them to care, then I think from an economic, political sense, uh, the United States will decline in a, in, a, in a much more accelerated way than it's already declined. Um, and every indication is that they are winning, right? That the inequality, the people who care about inequality, the Pinkettys of the world, the Paul Krugmans of the world, are winning. Uh, but to me, this is a battle that has to be fought. This is, a, this is a struggle that has to be engaged in. Look, in my view, what really motivates the inequality debate? Because I don't think the stuff we've talked about so far is that hard. I mean, if you look at unequal societies, People are doing well in those societies. I mean, free, unequal societies. The battle should be about freedom. But you see, the left, the modern left, the new left, the left of today doesn't care about the poor. It doesn't care about, uh, about progress. It doesn't care about, you know, wealth creation. They want equality for the sake of equality. They want to destroy for the sake of destroying. They want to knock stuff down for the sake of knocking stuff down. They want to see America become egalitarian. They know America will be poorer if it's get more egalitarian. They know America will produce less if it's more egalitarian. It'll have even fewer patents relative to Finland if it becomes more egalitarian. It will. If you take the incentive away from Silicon Valley, there'll be fewer patents filed. It's very simple. But they don't care. It's not about, and it's not about the poor. It's not about the poor. 
Because they don't care about the poor. Because the poor are the ones who suffer the most when the economy hurts. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example which is going to be controversial because it's 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 uh, controversial in America. Where never mind Europe. Minimum wage. Minimum wage, right? Everybody loves the minimum wage, right? You, you have a minimum wage in Belgium. Yeah, what's what's the minimum wage in Belgium? How many euros? I don't know. Six point five. Oh, pretty low. Okay, 6.5 euros. What's that? Doesn't matter. And it's in that range. In the United States right now, it's seven and a quarter. Obama wants to raise it to uh, 10, 10.10. 10 dollars .10. $10 and 10 cents. What's that? He raised it for federal contractors. He can do that unilaterally, but he wants Congress to pass a law that everybody, it raises to 10.10. .10. Right now, it's seven point something. What is the consequence of raising the minimum wage. Actually, not even raising it. What is the consequence of, of having a minimum wage? Who benefits? Who suffers? Who suffers from having a minimum wage? The people on the lower side. They are running out of work. So, so who, are the, who, 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 who most suffers? The poorest of the poor. And this is who suffers. If you're young, if you didn't go to school, if you live in an inner city, usually means you belong to an ethnic, uh, ethnic minority in the United States. You're the one that suffers, because the left uses this, right? They pretend that they can't. You're the one who suffered. Why are you going to suffer? It's a price control, right? What happens, how many of you take in economics, economics 101? What happens if I set a price? What happens if I artificially raise a price? price of bread, the price of electricity, the price of anything. What happens if I artificially raise it? I force the producer to raise it. What happens to demand for that good? It drops. So if I raise the price of unskilled labor, which is what a minimum wage does, what happens? What happens to demand for unskilled labor? It goes down. Now this is economics 101. It's, a, it's like gravity. This doesn't change. Who suffers? The kids who are unskilled, who've never had a job in their life, who can't produce a $10. They just can't. They're not skilled enough. They will never, ever have a job. What happens to, how, many, how much time do people usually spend making the minimum wage? How many years do people work at the minimum wage? Yeah, very few. Less than one year, I think. For the most part. Why? Because what happens after you work for a year or two? You get, experience. you get experience and you're worth more. And you start getting paid more. But if you deny people that first entry into the workplace, what will happen? They'll never enter the workplace. So what the minimum wage does is it institutionalizes young, poor people into unemployment. They will never have a job. Now you think the left that cares about poor people would be really, really upset. And they would want to do away with the minimum wage to give opportunities to young people. But they don't. Because they don't care. They don't look far enough. They don't rationalize. Right? No, I think that they know exactly. If you, these, are, these are smart economists who, who advocate for raising the minimum wage. They know economics 101. They know exactly what this will do. And they don't care. Now, who benefits from the minimum wage? Increasing the minimum wage. By the way, who else loses? Who else loses when you raise the minimum wage? What happens if the people who work at McDonald's get minimum wage? If you raise it from seven to ten dollars, what happens at McDonald's? Prices go up. Prices are going to go up. Who buys McDonald's? I'm mean, not in a touristy place like here, right? Who buys McDonald's in like in, in, in America? Who are consumers of McDonald's? Poor people. So what have you just done? You've raised the prices for poor people. Again, you've lowered the standard of living. Who benefits? By the way, shareholders lose. They take a one-time hit because when you raise the price, the return on capital goes down, so the, so the stock price goes down. So they take a hit. Nobody cares about shareholders, so that's fine, right? <laughs> shareholders lose. Poor people lose. Young and skilled laborers lose the most. Right? All of them lose. New entrepreneurs lose. Don't start new businesses to employ people who would make the minimum wage. 
So you have fewer jobs. Uh, more than that happens. What happens, um, like the woman, the woman or the guy standing behind the counter taking your order at McDonald's, right? I want a uh, beef patty and da 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 da. Maybe, but maybe it turns out that the difference between 7 and 10, I can put an iPad there and you can just click on what you want and I don't need this person. So now I've increased unemployment even more because I've mechanized, but mechanized artificially, right? Didn't, I didn't need to put this iPad there. She was fine at 7 bucks an hour, but at 10 bucks I can't afford her anymore. So now I put the iPad in there. The winners are, the guys who make the iPads, the winners are unions that have their salaries linked to the minimum wage. The winners are the older employees who are going to be kept on at 10 bucks when I fire all the kids who, are, who, who have less experience. Those are the winners. There are always winners and losers in these cases. Right? But the losers are huge and nobody cares. Everybody's for the minimum wage. It has 70% approval rating. Now you're right, some people don't think. But the intellectuals know, the economists know, but they don't care. And it's hard to comprehend, but they don't. And the whole debate about inequality is not about economics. It's about ethics. It's about morality. It's about the fact that they view inequality as ethically immoral. It's unethical. It's, a, 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 you know, oppressive. Because economically, it's, it's kind of obvious. Uh, is Inequality uh, caused by cronyism uh, unethical? Yes, so because good question. Money printing, you see, uh, raises the shareholders' value and but it doesn't create value. It's a good question. So there's one type of inequality that's wrong, but of course it's not associated with a free market. It's associated with cronyism, because what is cronyism? Cronyism, cronyism is coercion. Cronyism is force. So in my view, there are two ways of getting money. You can create it by building wealth, by working for it, or you can steal it. Inequality generated from creating wealth is good. Inequality created, anything created from stealing is bad, because stealing is bad. Cronyism, when a company comes to government and says, protect me, right? Have your regulations so there are no competitors. Or when the Fed prints money, and what does printing money do? This is a, 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 the, the central bank and the Federal Reserve are now engaged in one of the largest redistribution of wealth schemes ever. From poor people to, old, to rich people. It's bizarre, right? Because when they print all this money, what happens? Stock markets goes up. Who owns stock? I mean, a lot of rich people, now pension plans also own stock, which are for the workers. So it's not all rich people. The distribution of wealth gets all skewed. And all, and who suffers? People are saving money in bank accounts or in bonds. They suffer. So it's a redistribution of wealth all over the place. It's not clear which direction, but it's screwy, and that's force. So yes, cronyism is the one thing that all coercion. Cronyism is just one form of coercion, right? All coercion is the distortion, and is wrong and should be stopped. But notice that the people concerned about inequality never complain about cronyism. They complain about capitalism. That's the enemy. I mean, if the enemy was cronyism, I'd be all with them. Yeah. Um, notice you're saying that the advocates of equality are fundamentally driven by jealousy of successful people. Yes. I, no, I agree with that. So when I say what they're really concerned about is knocking this down, what that means is they're driven by, I use envy, because en envy is a stronger word, of envy of these people, and they want to see them suffer. They want to see them knocked down. It's not about raising these people. It's about knocking these people down. And I think, I think much of the inequality debate, much of the advocacy of inequality is about envy. And I'll give you an example of a study that's been done. Uh, I'll ask each one of you, here's the question. You've got two options. I'm going to hand out some money. This is theoretical. I'm not actually going to give you the money, right? I'm willing to give you, um, I'm willing to give you a thousand dollars, and give your neighbor a thousand dollars as well. That's possibility one. Okay. Possibility two. I'll give you two thousand dollars, and I'll give your neighbor ten thousand dollars. 
Which one do you prefer? So in one it's a thousand, a thousand. In the other, it's two thousand, ten thousand. And you can't negotiate the shit. <laughs> so how many one option one? How many want option two? Okay. So we've got three insane people and the rest of them. <laughs> Why do you care what your neighbor gets? For you, 2,000 is more than 1,000. Your life is better. All you should care about is that your life is better. Right? Now, assuming your neighbor is not a bad guy and not a crook and not a whatever, right? But the fact is that when you do these surveys out there, most people choose option one. They'd rather screw their neighbor than get more money for themselves. Now that's envy. Now it's a bit of an artificial experiment because the money's coming out of nowhere and, and you don't know quite what to do with it. But it, 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 it's illustrative, right? All you should care about is, hey, I'm better off. Good. Why do you care how you are relative to somebody else? I mean, I, I am happy, literally happy, when, when another billionaire is announced. I mean, put aside cronyism. Let's assume it's gone away. When a billionaire is announced. Because I go, wow, that's so cool that somebody's made so much money. Because what does it mean that he made so much money? How did we say before that you make money? Yeah, he created value. He lived, he, he created value for himself, he employed people, and hey, my life's probably better because he created this value. He invented some app on the iPhone, or he, you know, did whatever. And I don't, I don't use WhatsApp. I don't know if you guys use uh, that $19 billion for the chat thing. I don't use that. I'm still happy that they made billions of dollars. They're creating value for me. But they have 200 million customers? That's good. I think Facebook's nuts to pay them that money, but that's a separate story, right? So, this experiment shows the impact of envy. Yeah. But I have to say that those experiments show that the majority of people choose the first option, but under democracy, everybody has one vote. Yeah, I, 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 I think democracy is a bad system. In this sense, democracy where we vote on everything is a bad system. Um, I'll give you a, 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 the, the classical example of democracy in action, right, is Athens, right, ancient Athens. And it's not pure democracy because not everybody's voting, but a significant proportion of the population is voting. And Socrates is walking around town, and he's challenging young people. He's like, you know, I'm challenging your religion, I'm asking you tough questions, I'm doing all this stuff. So all the, the people of Athens get together and they say, this isn't good. We need to stop Socrates. How do you stop Socrates? Yeah, the only way to do it is to kill him, right? Because you know he's never going to stop speaking, right? That's what he does. He challenges people's beliefs. So they vote. Who's for killing Socrates? And I don't know what the margin was. 51%, 75%, 99%. Does it matter? Do they really have a right to kill Socrates because of what he says? We in modern Western Europe say no, right? But they believe in democracy. So they voted. And the vote was, yes, we killed Socrates. They gave him the poison, right? And part of the story is Plato, his student, says to Socrates, I've got a tunnel, we can escape. And what does Socrates say? No, I believe in democracy. And he drinks the poison. Now, I don't believe in that kind of democracy. I don't believe you can vote to have me killed. I don't believe you can vote to have me silenced. You don't like what I say. I don't believe you should be able to vote to take my money. It's mine. I don't believe you should vote to take my house. It's mine. So I believe, I don't believe in democracy. I believe in a constitutional republic where there's a constitution that says speech, property, life, da 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 da, -da. You can't vote on. There are a few things here and there you can vote on. They're pretty insignificant at the end of the day. But, but the government, I mean, they're important. Like defense, like police, like how to define private property. It's pretty tricky sometimes. That's what you can vote on. But other than that, you're left alone. Okay, one more time and then we'll go. Yeah. When you say that the U.S. Constitution 
comes pretty close to your idea of constitution. Yes. But still, we have this colonialism. Yes, because people don't believe in the constitution. So, so constitutions can't survive a culture that doesn't believe in them anymore. I don't know if you've been Hayek, but Hayek tries to manufacture a constitution that's just perfect and, you know, it just gets everything right. But one of the big problems, there are many problems with this constitution, but one of the problems is it doesn't matter. If the people over here who live under this constitution don't believe in it anymore, they'll trash it. So what you need is education. What you need is to get people to believe in it. But to do that, you have to have people who believe in rights, who believe in freedom. And that's hard. I mean, George Bush once said uh, uh, something like, all men have freedom in their hearts. All men desire freedom. This was when he was invading Iraq to bring them freedom. Right? Operation Iraqi Freedom, it was called. All human beings desire freedom. And I immediately said, that's just not true. All of human history is an example of where people didn't desire freedom. They were more, much more like what he said before. You know, they just want to follow. They just want to, don't think about it. They just want to be dumb about it. Freedom is a value you have to fight for all the time. Countries or people that value freedom will find a way to create an appropriate constitution, appropriate system to value, to do. People who don't, don't. The constitution is a technical means to help sustain the freedom once it's established, but it's not perfect and it won't, it won't protect you from a change in the culture. But more than that, let me get to this ethical point because uh, it relates to inequality, but it's broader than this. There's a fundamental, there's a fundamental problem uh, that we have in the West today. Not today, but we've had it in the West for 2,000 years. And that is that this notion of freedom, this notion of individual rights, is in conflict with our ethics, with our deeply held moral beliefs. What, is, what does ethics tell us? What does morality tell us? What is, what is value? What is virtue? What is goodness? What is noble? Who's a saint? I mean, a saint not from a Catholic perspective, but a saint from a moral perspective. What do you have to do to be a saint? Put aside your self-interest. Put aside your self-interest. But it's not enough to put aside your self-interest. What do you have to do? You have to sacrifice. You have to live for other people. You have to help them at your own expense. That makes you good. That makes you virtuous. That is 100% incompatible with capitalism, freedom, and individual rights. Think about Bill Gates for a second. How many people did he help, did we say before? By making money, how many people did he help? Billions, right? Billions. Did he get any moral credit for helping six billion people? Did anybody say, whoa, Bill Gates is a good guy. He's an ethical guy because he's helped so many people. Why? Because he did make money at the same time. I'll get to it. Let me finish this point. He did help himself at the same time. When did Bill Gates become a good guy? When he left Microsoft and he starts giving his money away. right? So building Microsoft, making Microsoft, helping all these people, millions of people, billions of people, that doesn't count ethically. But once you've created the wealth, giving it away, oh, now you're a good guy. But he's still not a saint. How would we make Bill Gates a saint? What would he have to do to go down in history as a great moral leader? Giving away his money. He'd have to give it all away. He'd have to move into a tent. And he'd have to, if he could bleed a little bit, <laughs> that would do it. He wouldn't have to perform a single miracle if he did that. Now, none of us would want to be him. But we would say, oh, wow, isn't that noble? Isn't that moral? Isn't that good? And history would remember it forever for taking away $70 billion in bleeding. The bleeding is important because you have to suffer. If you're, you know, he's giving his wealth away now, but they still don't like him. Why don't they like him? Because he's having fun doing it. He seems to be enjoying it. That's no good. That's not moral. Morality is about suffering. See, that morality, which is altruism, the morality of altruism, the morality that Augustine coined as altruism, the morality of self-sacrifice, self the morality of other people are more important than you. You have to sacrifice for them. You're your brother's keeper. That morality is killing us. It's killing the West. It's behind this inequality debate. You know those rich guys over there? Their moral duty, their moral responsibility based on every religion, 
based on every secular philosophy, is to give their money to the poor, and they're not. All we're doing is helping them be better people. We're just helping them by taking their money and giving it to the poor. It's just a manifestation of our ethics to these guys. So the challenge is, the challenge is to replace this morality of altruism with a more proper morality of self-interest. A morality that says that your primary moral responsibility, your only moral responsibility, is to your own happiness. It's to you. It's to making your life the best that it can be. It's to make you the most of your life. It's to flourish. It's to succeed. It's to live a great life. That's what morality should be about. And then you can ask the question, well, how do you do that? What are the steps? Is cheating, lying, and murdering people, does that equate, is that is that okay with living a flourishing life? It turns out no. But you have to figure out the steps that it takes to be a flourishing, successful, happy human being. But that should be the purpose. And what kind of political system do, 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 do self-interested people want? A political system that forces them to give away their money, that tells them what businesses they can start and what they can't, that regulates every decision that they make, tells them how much sugar should be in their peanut butter. Now people, people with self-esteem, people with self-interest, people who care about their own happiness, don't want mother government telling them what they can and cannot do every second of the day. They want to be left free. They want to be left alone. They want a political system that leaves them alone. So the real challenge here, and the reason why the inequality debate is going against us, the reason why we're moving more towards statism and away from capitalism, has nothing to do with economics. We won the economic debate decades ago. Decades ago, capitalism works better than any other system. There's no question. What we lost is the moral debate. We lost because we never participated. Because we've always accepted the morality of altruism. We've always accepted the fact that our moral duty is to other people. But it's not. Your life is yours. To live as you see fit for the purpose of your own happiness. And the challenge of morality, the challenge of the science of morality, is to figure out how do you do that. What steps do you need to take in order to achieve the best life that you can achieve? If you win that debate, then inequality, who cares? If I'm focused on my life, if all I care about is being happy, I don't care what the neighbor does. I mean, as long as he's not hurting me. I don't care how wealthy he is. I'm focused on me. I'm a selfish bastard. Selfish people don't worry about their neighbors. They don't worry about inequality. They worry about themselves. They want to make the best for themselves. So to me, that's the battle. It's a moral battle. Uh, he had a question that I delayed. Yeah. Um, well, I don't believe that Bill Gates is that much of a hero because the only thing he did, which was an important factor, that um, that he um, he just brought the piece of the puzzle together. But I believe it was more like a collective and, um, thing. Like people were like this technology was there, and they, they worked together to, to get this thing done. It turns out that putting the puzzle together is worth $70 billion. That it, not everybody could do that. Otherwise, somebody else would have done it. Nobody, it's not, and remember, it's not just about creating the software. It's about knowing how to market it. It's about knowing how to leverage it. It's about knowing how to get it into people's hands. Nobody else did that. He changed the lives of 6 billion people. Maybe somebody else could have done it. Maybe if there was nobody, somebody else would have done it. That's fine. But then that person would have created that amount of value. To me, he's a huge hero because he created so much value. And he did something nobody else did. Other people were trying, nobody else succeeded, including Apple, which, if you remember, was nothing. Right? It's only now that Apple's bigger than Microsoft because the government stopped Microsoft. Yeah, go ahead. One thing that disturbs me about the economy is that, um, that it doesn't. Um, economically um, good for a company to have to create a product that um, lasts long like a product should last like two or three years and then they should buy a new one like so that is a complete myth it's not true and I'll give you a, you can you can run the experiment in your head let's say all of you are building or choose a product 
whatever product you want. A computer. And your computer's only last two years. Because you said it's, you want to replace it. And I come into the market, and I say my computer's last five years. And I charge a little bit more than you do. What's going to happen? Some people are going to buy my computers and not buy your computers. And if they might really do last five years, then a lot more people will buy mine. If the marketplace values five years, now it turns out in computers, I don't want a computer the last five years. Does anybody here want a computer the last five years? Okay, well then, Apple's last five years. I have one, and it lasts five years. But I don't want a computer the last five years. You know why? Because in two years, I'll be much faster, much better, much cooler. And, I, you know, I buy an iPhone every time a new one comes out. Not because anybody forces me. Because it's, it's better. It's more productive. It's more efficient. And it's cooler. I like it. It's not good for the earth. It's not good for the earth? <laughs> why do you care about the earth? <laughs> the USB stick has done much more things good for the environment than all the wait, wait, wait. What is the environment? I, I want to understand this environment thing because I've never, I haven't quite figured this out. What is the environment? It's like a place to live. Okay, so a good environment would be a place that's good for us. Yeah, where you can live. Good. So the environment is the human environment. What's the? When have we had a better human environment than right now? When have we lived longer, healthier, had more fun, been more, had, you know, great things happen to us than right now? The environment has never been cleaner, has never been better, has never been healthier than the environment we have right now. But what if things change, like with the carbon thing? Like what would happen if, if let's say, let's say the global warming thing is true, and I don't want to debate it, but let's say it's true, because I don't really care if it's true or not. And the Earth is warming, what will happen? Um, we will have less environmental space to live in. Will we? Wait, like what? what? What will go away? Because the sea level will rise, we will have less... Um, sea levels will rise a little bit. You guys here will be, will, will be affected a little bit. Uh, but a lot. Seven meters, well, even the catastrophic predictions yeah, don't predict right. seven meters. But look, what will, what will they do in Amsterdam if the sea, rise, uh, sea rises? Because it's already, Amsterdam is below sea level, right? So what will they do in Amsterdam? Well, They'll build yeah. higher dikes. Um, but is that sustainable to do every time? I don't think so. Why not? I mean, I mean the technology is there. You can dig deeper into the ocean bed. You can build thick stuff. There's no engineering problem of being, building bigger dikes. Uh, but, but you know, so let's say let's say Florida floods. We don't have we don't have the money to build dikes all around Florida. Florida floods, right? What happens? What will happen? Less pensioners. So, less pensioners, which is cheaper, right? It's like smoking. You know that smoking actually lowers the cost of healthcare because people die, which is cheaper. Um, Florida floods, then people will move. Nobody will actually die, the pensioners won't die, they'll just move somewhere else. Have human beings ever moved in human history because of weather? Yes. Yes, of course they do all the time. What is a bigger threat? What is a bigger threat to human life? Global warming or the next ice age? Which is going to happen because you can't avoid an ice age. What's a bigger threat? Well, you can accelerate it and, and make it more Sure, so it'll be a little warmer. I live in the desert. You guys have nothing to worry about. I'm the one who has to worry. And all that will happen is my electric bills will go up because I'll consume more air conditioning. Really? Canada becomes habitable. I might have to move to Canada. But it actually become warm so you can live there. I mean, the hysteria around this stuff is mind-boggling to me. We live, and this is this is part of the guilt, this is part of the altruism that has generated guilt in the West. We feel we feel like, okay, we're not exploiting, we can't we can't explain our success by saying we exploit this people or that people. So now we have to feel guilty about trees and shrubs. <laughs> we live the best lives we've ever lived. We live the highest standard of living, we live longer, we live healthier. We have wonderful lives. Stop worrying. Have fun. 
The world is not going to end because of global warming. Indeed, temperatures have been flat for 14, 16 years. Well, so even the data is not true. Right? But even if it gets warmer, we'll figure it out. We'll create technology. You know what the solution is? Let's put ash in the atmosphere to cool it down. There are lots of technological ways to make the to, to solve the problem that don't involve stopping to live. Because that's what that's what dealing with global warming means. It means stopping to use CO2. You can't live without CO2. And you know who... You can lower the rates of CO2. Okay, so let's lower the rates of CO2. Who, who is going to suffer if you lower the rates of CO2? If you stop producing, if you stop using energy, you stop the growth in production of energy, who will suffer? I'm not going to suffer, believe me, in Southern California. I'm, we're set. Who's going to suffer? The poor will suffer. And which poor? Who, who, who is going to suffer the most? China. No. Africa. Because Africa has no development. So new development is going to happen in Africa. So they fucked. So what? So they fucked like that. If there is no water, you'll be fucked. No, this is, this is a challenge if you're an African. You're in the middle of the Sahara. You're in the middle of, the, you're in the middle of Africa. How yeah. do you survive if you're an African? With air conditioning. But you can only get air conditioning if you build a power plant that produces electricity that spews CO2. But this is the point. If you're in a hut in Africa today, it's you're good poor, it's 90 degrees, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever it is, centigrade, outside, and this is life. And you're going to live like this forever, option one. Option two is temperatures go up to 100 degrees, 10 10. That's huge, right? Even the global warming don't think it could go up that much. 10 degrees, 10%. But now, you live in a nice house with air conditioning in it. I take option two. I don't know about you guys. Technology, wealth, progress is much more important than climate. Climate always changes. It might go faster because of human activity. It might go slower because of human activity. Who knows? I don't. Maybe, maybe the scientists know. Maybe they're right. I don't know. But the point is... That, that doesn't matter. What matters is the quality of human life, and the quality of human life depends on CO2 emission. And the quality of human life for Africans depends more. You know, I can probably afford to put solar panels on my, I mean, it's stupidly, ridiculously expensive, and I will never do it, but I could afford to do it. So I could survive without CO2. Africans can't. What, what you're doing, just like with the minimum wage, is to make you middle-class Europeans feel good about yourselves. You're destroying the lives of African poor. That's exactly what the environmentalist movement is. It's a movement of middle class Europeans and Americans who have life set, life is fine, victimizing the third world. Because you're going to deny them economic progress. And that's a fact. That's not debatable. The fact is they cannot produce energy to create an industrial revolution of their own without CO2. So, I'm for human life. I don't care about spotted owls, I don't care about snails, I don't care about these animals. I mean, if you like them, buy some and, 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 and put them in your forest. But I care about the human environment and I look around the world and I say capitalist economies have the best human environment. The West, which is, has some capitalism still in it, luckily, has the longest life expectancy, the healthiest lives, and, 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 and the, the, the best quality of life. I want, because I care about people, I want Africa to have the same quality of life we do. So I want them to have property rights, I want them to have freedom, and I want them to have lots and lots and lots of coal-powered energy plants. Because that's how you succeed in life. By the way, people say that global warming causes really bad storms. And maybe that's true. Again, I'm not going to argue. I doubt it. But, but, but let's put that aside. How many people do you think die of weather-related effects today versus 100 years ago? The weather, let's say the weather's worse today. I don't know that it is, but let's say it is. How many people die more from hurricanes and, and, and tornadoes? And soon they'll blame earthquakes on global warming as well, but they haven't yet. But they'll find a way to do that one day. Where do you think people die more? 100 years ago, it's not even close. <laughs> because they didn't have the technology to protect themselves from weather. We have the technology to protect ourselves from weather. Why? Because we burn CO2. There's almost nothing in this room that doesn't come from oil. 
Oil is the most magical, amazing, that black stuff, yucky, most amazing product we have ever invented. I mean, come across, used. Nothing comes close. I mean, a lot of your clothes have polyester in it. That's oil. Anything plastic here is oil. Many of the construction products here have oil, and oil was used in their production. There's nothing in modern life that is not dependent on oil and CO2 energy. We should celebrate it. We should. I love oil and natural gas. Coal is a little yuckier, but I love coal too, because most of my electricity is from coal. These are wonderful products, and if they create problems, let's deal with the problems. But the problems are not by shutting these things down. The problem is, okay, what do we do about rising sea levels? Let's deal with that. What do we do about it getting warmer? Let's deal with that. But not, you don't destroy it. This is why, again, it goes back to what, what the left is and, and the environmental movement generally is about is knocking this down, not about raising anything up. It's about envy. Yeah. Some of you look tired, so we're going to end soon. Uh, uh, so let's assume global warming is uh, indeed uh, true. Uh, wouldn't a uh, consequent uh, liberal approach be that uh, if you cause uh, global warming, uh, the negative externalities that you cause to the property rights of other individuals is used to be or No, because this is not an externality that can be even measured like that. Everybody uses slogan food. Then you then you you can't on a, on a on a scale like that. The only way to do that is through the legal system. And you can't with CO two because everything we consume consumes CO two. Have you ever seen the little carbon footprint? Right? You get you get these things and I tell you how much carbon what the carbon footprint of something is. Right? When is it zero? What's the only time your carbon footprint is zero? Even when you're dead, it's not zero because you're decomposing, which emits CO2. The only time your carbon footprint is zero is when you're decomposed. And our natural phenomena should be treated like that. Now, if I, my factory is spewing out cyanide and you're breathing it and getting sick from it, then you have legal recourse against me to shut me down. But that's you and me, or 10 of you and 10 of me. But it can be society-wide. There is no such thing. If once it's society-wide, it's nature. We are nature. I mean, that's another thing the environmentalists do, is they have nature and man. Not according to evolution, which I believe in. We're part of nature. Boy, if you're religious, God created us part of nature. You know, we're part of it. So our activity is not an externality. It's only an unusual activity, like spewing a particular poison, that particularly poison a particular person, that's an externality that needs to be compensated for. But something that's culture-wide is not an externality. Okay, we'll take two more questions, and then we're going to stop, because it's getting late. Uh, you promote selfishness. Yes. But if everyone is selfish, you can't rely on private uh, funding and charity to feed the cripples. Don't we? So... I don't believe that's true for, for, for two reasons. One, I think the crippled will primarily be funded by the families who have responsibility over them, people who love them. Second, I happen to think that selfish people, uh, that uh, self-interested people, that free people are the most benevolent people in the world. Now, we don't want to see children suffer. We don't want to see people suffer for no cause of their own. I mean, if it's self-inflicted, I don't mind. But if, but if you know, you've had an accident or something bad happens to you, I'm happy to help because you're a human being and I value human beings. That's a selfish act. It's a selfish value to me. Other people are selfish value to me. I benefit from other people. So I think, I think you'd have more charity than you could spend. But if you didn't, then you didn't. Then people would suffer. But the, the point is this. The fact that somebody's crippled doesn't make me a slave. Doesn't automatically give him a way to stick his hand in my pocket. Right? You, you had an accident. You can't afford the help. You can't afford. You, you, I don't know. You you're going to be crippled, and there's surgery to fix it. Right? You've got two options, and only two options. You, let's say you don't have enough money to pay for the surgery. You've only got two options. You can come to me and ask for my help, and make the case why I should help you, and I might help. You. If you're a nice neighbor, if I have excess money, I'll probably help you. 
But I might not. Or you could pull out a gun and steal my money. Those are the only two options. Because notice what we do in democracy. We get the neighborhood together and we vote to steal my money. And somehow it's not stealing anymore because we voted. But it's still stealing. You're still taking my money by force when I don't want to give it to you. It's mafia, right? You've hired somebody to do it for you. That's the two options in life, ask or steal. I'm against stealing, always, in every case. That's it, whether you vote on it or you don't vote it, I'm against stealing. So all you're stuck with is charity and hopefully there'll be enough, and if there isn't, there isn't. That's life. Last question, yeah. Brother Lukemans of, of the OECD about Belgium, and they were asking, and we have the highest taxes, why can we raise them? And they found two things. One was raise the taxes on CO2, and raise the taxes on property. Yeah, no, in, in property, they love to raise taxes on property because property is a sign of wealth. And that's an easy one to raise property on. And of course, CO2 is politically correct now. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, we want to raise it as high as possible. And in the United States, we don't have any CO2 taxes, and uh, we still have a lot of room to raise. All our taxes can go up a lot. So uh, we're in for a long ride because there's a lot of room, a lot of taxes we can raise. You know, we don't have a wealth tax. Do you guys have a wealth tax? Not yet. Not yet. But that's, that's coming. See, the West will get out of its debt problems by trying to do a wealth tax. And then it's over. That, that's the end. When, when they institute universal kind of wealth taxes, uh, we've lost the battle. Thank you all.